So to, to you, Miguel and Charles, I'm asking a specific question. Um, one of the things that Jill said is that by doing embedded research, there are benefits to the health system that we'll come to now, but that there are benefits also for the researcher themselves that by being embedded, it provides um, a better ability to have a, 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 a more precise and more relevant question, research question, and such that your results would be uh, more relevant. Do you agree with that? What has, has been your experience with regards to how embedded research has strengthened your work and your ability to do your work? Not so much about the health system, but on the, on the academic side. Um, no, I think it's difficult to answer that, but um, my, my perspective is that it, it, it depends. Mm. And I think it has, I mean, sometimes, uh, I mean, many of these concepts come from WHO because WHO as well has to renew every certain time and then comes with new concepts that uh, some they were really new and some they're already old but with a new name. And, and then immediately, they, for me, there's a big jump into that because this is new and this is something that maybe should be done, immediately this is translated in a more effective or in a strengthening the health yeah. system. And that could be or not. Yeah. It depends on many, many, many factors. Yeah. And some of these factors were already represented here. So, so uh, for, I think for us in general, as I tried to mention, and maybe I agree with uh, Charles, what we were saying at the beginning, I think we should, we at least consider this as a, as a very important methodological approach and strategically approach in, in many occasions that has to be on the table, but that is not for everybody and mm. is not for any research questions. Mm. So mm. Um, it has to be very well thought what kind of research questions, what is the advantage of entering into this kind of uh, dynamic mm. uh, and what are the potential consequences, both bad consequences and, mm. and positive consequences. So, mm. so for me, it's not a straightforward uh, yeah, because when you enter into this kind of thinking and applying this kind of research, the research, uh, I mean, the, is going to strengthen the health system, the cell health system is going to work better, the research produce is going to be better mm. than in another mm. way. Uh, I don't think there is enough uh, mm. uh, experience for saying that. Mm. Charles? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think one of the clear benefits for us is uh, uh, being irrelevant in the Zambian society. I think that uh, from my code, the estimation is that in Zambia, 80% or, or even more of the problems we are grappling with are still preventable and controllable. And yet we have continued you know, you know, firefighting. Uh, uh, and when I look further, I see that the, the emphasis on public health, which to me is an opportunity for embeddedness, has not been emphasized. Mm. And so, uh, from my point of view, I saw that it's, a, it's an issue of leadership. We need, we need to have leadership that does see the value of embeddedness so that you're able to dictate your relevance. Mm. And this is what, what we did uh, uh, all the way in 2000 when we realized that for us in public health to be relevant, we needed to have an array of people, an array of networks and institutions with core requisite skills where, which will, will build our relevance to the society where we live in. Mm. And in fact, uh, the School of Public Health was on open this year in January, has been built from that foundation. Mm. And mm. so today, uh, we don't just have a School of Public Health that is standing, but that is functioning, sitting in technical working groups in mm. the Ministry of Health. Mm. We are sitting with our bilateral you know, you know, colleagues, when they want some work to be done, listen to we have UNICEF approaching us, mm. we have these high impact interventions that are not working in poor communities. Can you do this work? Because they have seen what skills we have, mm. multiple skills, mm. and so this is the benefit. So mm. it's a the learning system, Jill, that we are talking about, for me, this is the benefit. So mm. best can grow as a capacity, and so have an opportunity to further contribute in the society where you live. Mm, absolutely. So the issues about people-centeredness, I mean, I'm the same thing that uh, Walter raised. So Tulani, you, you raised this um, tamaleki, as they say here in the Western Cape, of the ethical dilemmas. Have you had an experience, and what I'm hearing from, from Charles is this whole notion of relevance. 
And I think that slide that Jill showed, that showed the wide variety of so-called embedded research, that includes things that our own government does at the moment with think tanks and things like that. So do you think maybe, so firstly, what has been your experience of those kind of processes providing the evidence base that does inform policy and practice? And secondly, what do you think um, we could do as a community to allay some of these fears that you are, um, you are, Rajani, also you can also think about that and also provide your comment on those, uh, on those questions. Uh, thanks. So there's certainly no doubt that uh, there's a lot of benefit from embedded research. Uh, benefits to policymakers, benefits to the health system, benefits to the research community. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, the, the slide that Jill shows, showed outlining um, those um, benefits, it's, it's, it's very important. I agree with and, and secondly, uh, the type of work I've been involved in qualifies for a subsection of embedded research called insider, insider-led research. Mm. So this is when somebody inside the system is conducting the study. Mm. You know, could be alone, could be in collaboration with others. So one, there's certainly no doubt that there are benefits to mm. embedded research. Number two, as I said, the types of challenges it tackles are not easy. Mm. And therefore, it's not for the faint-hearted, if I can put it like that. Mm. It's not for the faint-hearted. How one goes about doing it is demonstrating the benefits uh, even to the authorities. That in fact, even if we undertook this difficult undertaking, these are some of the benefits that could mm. accrue. Mm. Uh, to the stakeholders I, I have mentioned. So it's a, it's a negotiated space. Mm -hmm. But it raises the issue of how do you handle the data that you collect through embedded research. And again, I'll keep contrasting it with operational research and say, for me, the latter is much easier if you want to investigate the attitudes of professional health workers to community health workers, it's fine. Attitudes of uh, professional health workers to the use of UV lights for TB or wearing masks for TB. You could complete that in days and publish. But some of the issues I'm referring to include contestations mm. between spheres of government mm. about particular policy matters mm -hmm. and about particular interventions to address certain issues. Apart from those contestations, it includes perspectives about each other which have not been raised in public and which are not documented. So you are going to be the first person to document these things. <laughs> because this year has not openly said these things about that other sphere, and that other sphere has not openly said these things about this year. Your research study provides that opportunity for those things to be articulated. And when you look at those things, they're fundamental. Until they're addressed, the health system is not going to turn for better. Mm. They're fundamental, fundamental issues mm. that are being raised through your study. And in some instances, it's respondents within the organization, same organization, raising issues about those who are running that organization and how inappropriately they're running. Mm. You are the conduit mm. of that information. How do you articulate it in such a way that you improve the system, <laughs> but don't destroy mm. the relations that are there? So I think it's about how you, you handle the, the information. Mm. It can be done, but Jill said it requires highly, highly skilled uh, mm. researchers. Mm. And the, in the article, she, should, she said she is an example of master students going to mm. an institution and then collecting data, putting it It's that type of management mm. of the research data, the research output, the, 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 the ability to communicate it in such a way that it improves the system, mm. but you don't leave behind you 
mm. a series of damage in relationships and stuff. Like that. Mm. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, having been in this organization for seven years, I think applying the term embedded research now to what we do, I think one of the things it's helped us to do is to, because we work so closely in implementation, we can pick up innovations. And because we have implementers that are also researchers, it helps us to look at an innovation not just as a best practice, but to say, okay, what does it take for this to go to scale? What kind of advocacy is needed? Which stakeholders will be involved? So in a sense, we are slightly different from regular outside researchers who would just look at an issue and say, these are the problems with it, these are the solutions, but they'll go away. But we have a great opportunity to be able to continue with the process and therefore convert the embedded research into positive implementation. Um, also, I think embedded research in its best sense enjoys a lot more ownership amongst policy makers and programmers because you are, you are responding to questions which they are interested in. Mm -hmm. But having said all of that, I think, and I'm reflecting from our own work, there are some and quite a lot of serious challenges with it. So one is divergent interests in policy and program implementation. Mm -hmm. Your ability as a researcher, as an honest researcher, to be able to pick up findings which may not be exactly palatable to mm. policy makers, and then what they do with those findings can sometimes not be so savory. Mm. The second is even framing the problem often is done in a way to suit certain interests. Mm. Um, the third, there are multiple stakeholders for ownership for embedded research. Because you have to partner with a range of organizations, mm. then there's that ownership issue is also apart from being positive, can also be a very negative phenomenon. Um, financing is always an issue. How much do you allocate for financing for research versus, I mean, that goes for all mm. kinds of research, particularly mm. for embedded research, which is not less expensive than any other kind mm. of research. My final point, and from my own point of view as a practitioner, is the practitioner as researcher and losing objectivity mm. over the process. And sometimes this pressure to demonstrate positive results often makes you do things that you that uh, mm. an absolutely outside researcher mm. would not do. So this mm. insider outsider phenomenon that's mm. so part of embedded research mm. could also be a little bit problematic. Mm. Thank you. I think colleagues, you've had the presentation from Jill. You've had some examples. You've had some thoughts. I'm going to hand over to you now. All of, he, of you here, I'm sure, have a perspective, have an experience. Feel free to share your experience or if you have a, a question for any of our um, panel members.